Councillor Brian Kenny and I'm chair of this committee and I now declare this meeting formally open. Right, you've all got hopefully all your papers, your agenda, etc. And the first thing I'd ask is, are there any apologies, please? Step O'Keefe. Sorry? Step O'Keefe. Step O'Keefe. Oh. Sorry, she's not is she on this, not on this committee? She before, don't think, no. Sorry. No. Any apologies from anybody who spoke to me here? No. I do have uh, apologies from ACFO Mottram. But apart from that, no more? No? Okay, so, thank uh, you. As, as I said before, I have to leave the meeting to go to another meeting. Yeah, okay then, yeah, thanks. Has anybody got any declarations of incest in relation to any item? Please. Having said that, I think I've got to declare one myself. Because on the item about ICT, I'm actually employed by BT. So I just think I need to formally record that. Is that right? It's your fault. Yeah, it's my fault. Yeah. I'll probably get a load of stick after the meeting now about your bills and things. <laughs> okay. Right, um, as far as the agenda is concerned, I think I'm right in saying that there's two items which are exempt. That's agenda item five and six. So what I suggest is that we do what we normally do, take those two items at the end of the meeting. So when we get to item five, I will ask anybody who's, who hasn't got the, the right to be here to, uh, to leave the meeting. Okay? <coughs> right, so on that basis... Oh, yeah, sorry, I've been asked to say that for some reason... The microphones are not working today, so in case anybody's thinking I'm shouting long, louder than usual, we'll all have to do the same today. There's no mics. Okay? Right. Thank you very much. So the first item is agenda item two, which I think should be on page five of the of your pack. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I've already made a mistake. The minutes of the, uh, the last meeting, which are the minutes of the 1st of February 2018. You've all had a copy of the minutes. <coughs> and maybe agreed with the true record, or has anybody got any, any amendments? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, right, thank you. So they're agreed. And I, it's, it's agreed that I can sign them as chair then. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Next item, item number three, which is on page nine, I think, of the pack. Uh, and I think this is going to be presented by Phil, is that correct? Oh, 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 for the period April to July uh, 2018, so I'll just hand you that over to, to Jack. I'm Jack Wilson, I'm the Integrated Risk Management Plan Officer for the Avenger already. So as, as the Chief said, we will be looking at the period 1st of April to the 31st of July. So in December of each year, we ask each function to write a functional plan, which will Put out how they will deliver our IRMP <coughs> proposals, the IRMP being 2017 and 2020. Strategic leadership team then approved the functional plans for 18 19 in March and they go live on 1st of April each year. The action points from these plans are included in the service delivery plan, and this is what we're going to be talking about today, so what we're going to report on. Many of the actions rolled over from last year because they're long standing, such as the development of the St. Helens and Slogan Mass Fire Stations. TDA development, website development, <coughs> review of personal protective equipment, <coughs> staff survey, because obviously it's taking place, so that's going to carry on, and building on 2016 staff, staff survey feedback. So this chart shows cumulative performance <coughs> April, May, June, July for our main indicators, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Obviously, there was the extremely hot weather in June and July, and this had a massive impact on some of our performance indicators. The primary fires, primary fires are fires which involve insurable loss, and they've actually come in under target. So there were 31 less primary fires by the 31st of July 2017 than we did last year. The attendance standard, there was a slight drop in performance in July, obviously due to the the number of calls we were attending, both within Merseyside and over the border at Winter Hill and Saddleworth Moor, where we assisted. 
However, cumulatively, we have achieved our target of 92.1% of occasions. We get the first appliance to a life crystal still within 10 minutes. Carbon output of all buildings, which is measured in CO2 per square foot <coughs> per building, is under target of 25.4. Some further key performance indicators where we've met our targets are absence. Overall absence, which is TD09, 3.84% of shifts were to sickness absence, the target is 4%. Greybook, which are uniform staff, did actually go over target in July, which is, has caused it to go up slightly, but we are still within our 4% target. Accidental dwelling fires, we're 31 under target to date and remain consistent with performance last year, the figures have just remained pretty much the same. There was a peak in June of 96 incidents, but all of the other months have been lower than that. Fatalities and accidental dwelling fires, sadly we have, up to the 31st of July, we had one fatality on the room. Um, however, since then we have had a further one in the works, but that's not obviously in this report. We continue to target those we consider most at risk with safe and well visits. Accidental dwelling fires, injuries and accidental dwelling fires, Eight of the, of the seven injuries, sorry, eight of the injuries were at seven incidents. They were recorded as serious, meaning that the rest were considered minor, such as precautionary checks for smoke inhalation. Deliberate vehicle fires have been something which have appeared in almost all of my reports for the last few years. They've been a massive problem for ourselves and Merseyside Police. However, this, year, this period we are under target, the numbers falling. There were 44 less incidents in this period than the were in 2017. Uh, and cumulatively, there's only Nosley District, which is slightly over target by two incidents, so the numbers seem to be dropping on this type of incident at the moment. Key performance indicators where we are within 10% of targets. False alarms are monitored closely. And aside from hospitals, the majority are sheltered accommodation. Some are recorded as faults that aren't of the alarms due to cooking, due to aerosols. Community risk management work closely with these premises to encourage them to manage <coughs> their systems more efficiently, but we don't want to discourage calls. Both false alarms in domestic premises and non-domestic premises are fallen for this year when compared to 2017. <coughs> Performance indicators where we've not met our targets. As I mentioned earlier, the very hot weather in June and July had a massive impact on this. There were 4,317 more emergency calls received between April and July than we were in the same period last year. Just to give an example, in April this year we received 1,603 calls. In July it rose to 6,076. It's a massive impact the weather had on us. And that was the highest number for July since 2006. Total incidents attended, that was 278 more than this period last year. 3,673 of these incidents were in June and July. April saw fairly low numbers, so that's brought our numbers down slightly, perhaps not as high as we might have thought it would be. And total fires, crews attended 3,284 3, fires in April to July. That's 227 more than the same period last year. In July, there were 1,221 fires compared to 432 in April. Secondary fires attended were very low in April, just 233. However, in July, that rose to 1,020 with hot weather. St Helens Fire Station to date have attended the most deliberate secondary fires with 224 of that figure here being in their station area. Special services, although they're showing red, this is something we spoke about last time, it's not entirely red, but if we could we'd split it red and green because some special services actually generate income, such as lift rescues and affecting entry, and that raises approximately £15,000 a year for NFRS. Special services we attend mainly include affecting entry, lift rescue, assisting other agencies and removal of objects. Road traffic collisions were 20 over targets and 32 more than last year. There were 38 RTCs in July, which is the lowest number this year, but there was a peak in May for some reason of 70. 
and there's no mod fatality in the RTC to date. As numbers have increased, as expected, <coughs> the numbers have also increased, with 43 more than at July 17. The 42 of the injuries total were all in May when the, when the instant numbers shot up. Home fire safety checks. The numbers are actually less than last year when you compare them, but that is because <coughs> activity was suspended in June and July due to the volume of incidents where we attended to emergency calls and training only. So to date, the crews have delivered 11,876 home fire safety checks. 52.3% of them were from the status report, which identified households where there's at least one member of the family is 65 plus. 2,950 safe and well visits were delivered by advocates. And in total, we've delivered 15,221 HFSCs to the end of July. And that's it, thank you. Okay, thanks Jackie, thank you very much. Anybody got any comments or questions? Yeah, if I may, um, for those of you, uh, the, the targets are some that we're working towards. It's, uh, you know, uh, we, we want to see low levels of fire deaths, we want to see high levels of attendance, we want to see high levels of uh, home fire safety checks. The, the target figures are historically based benchmarks. Uh, against which we can uh, test our performance. Now, interestingly, we had a number of MPs, <coughs> others questioning us, questioning members. Are members aware of how we perform? What do we do to uh, check and, uh, and see how we are performing? And this is the method that we use. Community Safety Committee receives regular reports on performance, how we're performing, how, generally speaking, well we're performing against our objectives, and also where we are outside of our objectives, the, the reason why that might be. And in this case, it's the, you know, the sort of fires over the summer period will be the explanation. But again, I think what we're trying to do is to turn the authority more towards um, backbench scrutiny, and it's an opportunity for members to have an understanding of the way we're performing, to question that, to be aware of, of, of how we perform, and also to question officers on any improvements that could be made. But uh, uh, just to reinforce, when people say to us, how do, we, how do we operate the checks and balances as members against officers, it by, it's, like, it's by reports of this nature which we receive regularly. Thank you. Okay, thanks Les. Yeah, John? Gee, gee, looking at fires attended, and you look at it, and it's, it's throughout this, this summer that we've had, and, and how warm it's been, and we take and we accept climate change, we're going to get this constantly. Are the government taking on board these figures in relation to funding the services? Are we going to see the service being called on more? in future years in, in light of climate change. Sure, if I, if I may, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll respond. I think certainly from the National Fire Chiefs Council's perspective, they are looking at the broader impl implications yeah. for the likes of climate change, you know, because not only did it have an impact in Merseyside, it had an impact outside of Merseyside yes. too. And, and you know, given our national resilience role, we have coordinated a fair amount of response to Saddleworth Moor, Winter Hill, and, and, and so on and so forth. But due to the nature of the role that we fulfil, but also where the impact and the number of incidents that occurred across the whole of the UK. So, you know, even during the period where actually the north was was the warmest areas, uh, at that point in time, you know, in London, London was deploying 40 odd fire engines to tackle large scale wildfires in their particular localities as well. Uh, and part of part that submission that the National Fire Chiefs Council will put in with regards to comprehensive spending review will include elements of that, so government have got that kind of first hand around you know, the implications for services in deploying their resources to meet the demands that were placed on them at any particular point in time. For ourselves, you know, we've got to see it as, a, as risks in relation to how we deploy our resources, anticipate it and then plan accordingly to, to reflect that risk. You know, Jackie's probably alluded to 2006 as being kind of a, a point in time where we had a higher level of calls, but actually if you go from you know, some of the media stories more recently, it goes back to 1976, 
and the kind of temperatures, hitting the temperatures that they hit over that period. Our members will also be aware that I've worked in this organisation for 29 years. That's the busiest I've seen us for a protracted period of time. Busiest I've seen Merseyside, busiest I've seen the UK Fire and Rescue Service. So anticipating that the potential for this to be reoccurring, if it is linked into kind of to, uh, global warming and climate change, then Merseyside and you know, Fire and Rescue Service more broadly need to be able to kind of respond as effectively as possible can and ensure that governments are aware of the car, the, the implications to us as services, and we will do that part, part of our submission to the National Fire Chiefs Council, which will subsequently end up with the Home Office around you know, funding the service to meet the demands and the risks that are placed on them. Okay, thanks Bill. Anybody else? No? Okay, thanks Jackie. Can we agree the recommendation that the attached report is published on the website? Can we? Yeah, just before yeah. we got that, I just wanted yeah. to pick up on the kind of comments that have been made as well. If there are areas, as we go through some of the performance and, and council partners have absolutely you know, identified what we would want members to do, if there are things that we have raised concerns and members wanting to be picked up as part of the scrutiny processes, by all means do that and we will defer that to the kind of the scrutiny committee, which will focus particularly on that area and it will get underneath the skin of the reasons why performance is good, bad, or indifferent for that matter. Okay, yeah. So there was one thing, and it was on, um, on the report on page 25. Um, the sickness, sickness absence, I mean, it just says it, it increased. It doesn't, it doesn't really tell us a lot. I mean, it could have been due to two people having an accident. It could be due to long-term sickness. Um, you know, if we're going to drill on, or look at, at this kind of figures, I think sometimes you have to know the reasons for them. Um, because it, this is different, if I may say, it, it may have sickness levels, but if, if a couple of people have had accidents and they're long term, then that's going to really shove up uh, what, what is the, the, the statistics themselves. So, is it possible to have a little bit more on this? Because what is long term? What is short term? Are these due to accidents either at home or, or on the job? Because I think it would help us because we took more health and safety on it, not. Yeah, and, and, and yeah. Okay, well, you, will, you will be appreciated that this is high level this, and it is to allow that, that you to identify that as an area you, you would want some more information and to kind of scrutinise the performance there. All that information you are alluding to is readily available. It's managed to the performance management group, and they go into specific details around the circumstances and the reasons. And so we can provide you with all that information that you require, either through scu scrutiny mechanism or directly back into community safety. Thanks, Jim. Okay, yeah. Joe, Chair, just wonder from what Roy was saying, is, is, is there any correlation between the number of fires attended, with staff maybe some sickness going up, because I suspect they've been run off the feet, you know, yeah. over, over, the, over, this, over the staff period. There'll be some correlation there as well. We do, see, we do see increases in, in sickness absence over the summer period um, to a greater or lesser degree and then again, again in the winter period linked into kind of flu and you know, you know, flu-like symptoms and so on and so forth and we keep that under kind of consistent review. Um, do I think that some of these things are linked into the number of calls that were received over that period? I'm not sure at this moment time. I don't think they have been in that correlation. I think some of the sickness absence is directly linked to long-term sickness absence due to a number of circumstances from long-term injuries and you know, some kind of long-term absences which have a disproportionate effect on our figures, particularly you know, related to the grey book roles there under these circumstances. We see it happen where numbers are smaller, so like a fire control, if someone's off for a, one person's off for a particularly extended period of time because the numbers are small, that has a disproportionate effect. But more than happy to report back to members specific detail I would say as the community safety committee ought to be picked up by the scrutiny arrangements that we've got in place to be started. Chair, the, 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 the next question is yeah. it, can, it can skew it at times when there's someone suddenly said it's gone up to four percent. Whereas in reality if you've got a few long term sicknesses that can actually take it above and then just normal sickness can can, can drive it. So what might look as though you've gone over it, what is the percentage acceptable? It could be because of, of these kind of systems and, and the other things we should, we should understand and know about it. Yeah, okay, yeah. 
Okay, thanks very much. Anybody else? No. So the recommendations agreed. Right. Thank you. So we move on to agenda item four, which I think is on page fifty-three of your pack. And I think Phil, you're going to introduce this, mate. I, I, I will share, thank you. Um, and members will, will now appreciate how important our people are to the delivery of the fire and rescue service, and you know, that's a whole organisation rather than specifically in an operational context. Um, but it, it's, it's kind of, it covers all bases really. So, you know, from an operational consideration, we want our firefighters to be safe and effective as we possibly can. But we also recognise that we've got other mm -hmm. members of staff who are equally on the front line in communities, protecting those communities. So our advocacy teams going in to make people sure people are safe in the home. Some of our protection staff going out into the business community and ensuring the business community are protected. But equally extends into people who are in, in, in non-uniform roles who are supporting this organisation, deliver the best possible outcomes to the communities. They may work in, in finance, they may work in legal, they may work in the state team, they may work in, in human resources and so on and so forth. And this strategy is directly related to everyone who works in this organisation um, to ensure that they can be the best that they can be and they can support themselves, each other, and the authority in delivering the best outcomes to the public. The key parts to it, members, is, you know, is the construction of the strategy and the implementation plan, which will start to kind of embed this across the organisation uh, now and moving forward. Uh, and what we've sought to do with part, part of the, the report is to identify key components which, if we put these components together and we are able to deliver against them through the implementation plan, will be better, better for that and we will deliver an outstanding service to the public. So just to emphasise the, the, those six components and the purpose of them, taking to page 53, it identifies those six components what are contained within the strategy. First one is around strengthening leadership and line management to support the organisation, changing and improving improved community outcomes. And these six components are a direct lift from the National Fire Chiefs Council components. Um, and so it's, it's, it's an organisation on a sector led change. Uh, to provide excellent training and education to ensure continuous improvements of the service to the public. Again, ensuring that we are trained and equipped to meet all of those needs. Uh, maximise the well-being of our staff to create an environment where people are fulfilled, productive and challenged. And again, you know, we, we extensively worked on ensuring that the well-being of our staff is a key component of, of our people's strategy to date and will do again moving forward, uh, particularly around some of the work that we've introduced in our critical incident debriefing and the welfare and the occupational health support that individuals have had and will receive. Uh, developing our cultural values and behaviours which make the Fire and Rescue Service a great place to work, which again, you know, it's, it's self-evident, it's what we do do, uh, but it's just about reinforcing that through the strategic document itself. Improve our ability to provide good services by di diversifying our workforce and creating a fair, equitable place to, to work. That extends to gender equality, to beam equality, but it's also part, part of the positive action work that we would undertake on behalf of the authority. Members will know over the course of the next probably five years we'll be recruiting significant numbers into this service and we want those people in whatever role they fulfil, whether it's firefighting or in some of the important roles, that they reflect the communities that we serve and that's a key kind of you know, direction of travel for us uh, now and will be in the future. So you know, we're working positively to ensure that we are diverse because the more diverse we are, the better we are at serving the communities of, of Merseyside. And the final component is to adopt ways of working that respond to service needs. Um, and that reflects you know, the QC systems that we operate, the way that we bring people in, the flexibility that required from our staff, how do we underpin that and how do we deliver that moving forward. So those six components uh, wrapped up together uh, form the basis of the strategy. Now, clearly the strategy and then how we deliver that is, is wrapped up within the implementation plan, all which are contained within the documents that you've got in front of you. Um, but it's something that we are you know, really kind of keen to kind of get right. Um, and as a result of that, we've had staff, you know, and part of the staff engagement has been extensive in regards to the work that we've done to listen to the views of our people, to ensure that the views of our people are being distilled down into the document itself. And some of those things which are contained within the implementation plan are things that we've heard either on fire stations or in departments in functions, we've translated that into the plan and we will deliver against that plan over the course of the next number of years, but bring regular reports back to authority members in regards to how we are progressing there. We know there's a couple of bits that we would want to do, 
um, and you know, particular focus might be around progression for staff, progression particularly in our female members uh, of operational staff, where we don't see that kind of being as accelerated as we would want it to be. So we know there's bits of work that we will do over the course of the next you know, certainly number of months, number of years maybe, um, to deliver the best outcomes and ensure that our staff, our people, can be the best that we can be in delivering the best possible outcomes to the community. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Okay, thanks, Bill. Right, any questions, please? Yeah. yeah. Phil, the strategy, I presume this has been shared with your trade unions. Absolutely. And, well, yeah, okay. it wouldn't be a good idea then to, to, to actually put it in the document. That's true, that we've shared with trade unions. Yeah. And an agreement. I used to, when you do an agreement, at least it's understood and know what road you're travelling down. Um, just, just on that kind of basis. Because when, 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 I'm not talking about just those, but it's outside of this room. Uh, people start to see and they're discussing it. It's not a bad idea to say this has been shared with our trade unions. It doesn't have to say the agreement, it's just been shared with them. Yeah, look, I, I, absolutely, you picked that up, picked that up in the positive, of course. <coughs> I suppose the way that the, the, the strategy is being written, it's to be, you know, it, it, it's to be really, really inclusive, organisation inclusive, yeah. and focus on no particular a part of the organisation because sometimes again you know there's a I don't know a temptation to focus on you know, our operational firefighters in regards to the discharging of our services um, and sometimes you can you know displace that around other people in this organisation who feel that they contribute as equitably as, as everybody else and that's how it's written, it's written to kind of cover all bases of them. However you know, I, mean, I was gonna say I didn't I didn't mention union because I know both here. As you say, the firefighters and, and <coughs> you call the admin support staff, although I have the right to be a member of the trade union, so I know there's a couple of trade unions. It just went on the basis of, of saying that they, they are, for, for that, any other expression, they are the voice of, 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 of your workforce on the basis of that kind of thing. And it just, I was just wondering, it isn't to knock it to say, it's great sometimes, it's a fair point to say, we are fully aware of this and. If there's any problems at a later date, you can't help Absolutely. Help Absolutely. I, will, I will finesse it to kind of reflect those comments, uh, Councillor Graham. Um, but just to reassure members, you know, all representative bodies, all members of the amazing side finance service have contributed to the development of the strategy and the implementation plan, but I will finesse it accordingly. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Peter? Yeah, actually, just, just a couple of things. Uh, under, under number three about the well-being for, for our staff, um, and I know in the delivery plan, just a little, a little earlier that we've, we've gone through, um, one of the things was the uh, mental health first aid right um, training to operational staff. Uh, I know it's on hold at the moment. You know, it's, is it because of... It's not... It's OK. No, it's not okay. okay. Well, I just wanted to say for those of us that members that actually took part in that training um, some months ago. It was excellent and it was, it was well delivered. Um, and I think it's, it's crucial. I think it's, it's another, I think it's another feather in our cap as an authority <coughs> and a service that would provide that to, to our staff who do see, and you people that have been on the front line for a number of years, have seen uh, cases that can be very, very traumatic. And, um, you know, life changing for yourselves. So, in order to put this kind of training on, of course, it, it, it was excellent. I can't say it enough. The people who delivered it were excellent, and I think those of us that were there, I think I can speak for us all. We certainly did get something from it. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, can I just say another one about protecting our our, our workforce? And the other thing is, um, it was only recently that we were able to. Um, speak with our Princess Trust staff and um, basically tell them that they've got full time contracts because of funding that came in. Because obviously the staff were on um, time limited contracts, and we have had a turnover in recent, not, not a lot of turnover, but some turnover of, of staff moving on because there was no sort of continuity. Um, of, he didn't know for one that, you know, it was almost yeah. every year. Yeah. And if they've got kids, if they've got mortgages, etc., etc., this is now more sustainable. 
and, um, and to actually be there with, um, with, with Guy Keane um, when he, 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 he told them and they were just so relieved and so delighted and uh, you could just see the spring in the step because they can plan the future a bit more. So again, once again, another um, another positive yeah. and another great move for, for our staff, our senior staff supporting um, the Prince's Trust. So I just wanted to make that clear. No, thanks very much for that. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Can I just respond around this context as much around? I won't just tell you the game, you know, I'll pass it down about that stuff, but around the well-being, I, I will do. Um, and we have the inspectors who will land with Merseyside Finance, your service and authority probably, but at the latter part of this year, if we're not exactly clear on the timescales, or certainly early next year. And when we look at the kind of the services we deliver, some of the things that we would want to push forward, the kind, you know, and some of the things which we, you know, we know we've got the areas to work on and so on and so forth. When you look at the the work we do around the well-being of our staff, the occupational health support, I genuinely, genuinely think that there's no finer kind of provision in the UK fire and rescue service in the way we invest in our people around their well-being uh, and ensuring that they are looked after irrespective of their role, but particularly that our firefighters who are exposed to some quite traumatic events at moments in time. So that whole debriefing, diffusing, critical incident management is absolutely first class but all of the provisions that underpin that ensure that our staff feel valued and recognise the kind of the authority are seeking to look after them, recognising the challenging role that they fulfil on behalf of the community. So again, just to emphasise the point that Councillor Brennan's made, which I think the, the standards and the quality of service, particularly around the wellbeing of our people, is the example Okay, thanks Bill. Thank you very much. Anybody else got any comments or questions? No? Okay, so can you agree the recommendation, please, that the people strategy uh, and implementation plan be approved? Okay, thank you. That's item four. So before we move on, uh, I need to ask any members of the press and public to leave the room, please.